Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, meeting of the State Board of Elections. I'm Peter Pasutsky. Joining me today are my fellow commissioners, Henry Berger, Tony Cassell, Justin Bagnola, and uh, our staff. So we open up this today's meeting first as a board of canvassers, and we have to uh, certify the primary election results from the June 25th primary election. We have before us the results of that, and those are the challenges. I think these are the election results. Okay. So we have several. We have a document that the staff has provided us with uh, several contests around the state that were crossing county lines, which are the ones we're certifying. Um, I would entertain a motion to certify those uh, election results. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Discussion. All in favor, aye. 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 Any, anyone opposed? So that is carried unanimously. And that is all of the business we have before the Board of Canvassers. So we will go out of the Board of Canvassers and uh, come into session as the Board of Commissioners. Our first uh, business is the proposed minutes from the June 27th meeting. And again, I've entertained a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. And is there any no discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. I want to close. Those are also approved unanimously. Our next piece of business comes before the board are the ballot access determinations. Uh, we have a report again from the staff. We have two uh, petitions, either independent petitions we're talking about now. And there were two uh, petitions that were objected to here at the board. Uh, one is Mary Finneran, 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 sorry, for the member of assembly. It was a declination that was challenged. The other is the uh, independent petition of Robert Kennedy. Uh, the staff recommendation on uh, both of those is that the declination is valid and the petition is valid. I'll entertain a motion on those. Anyone wishes to move? I have a motion. Any second? Okay. Second. Uh, any discussion? Not all in favor. Vote aye. Aye. Opposed? Again, that is unanimously carried. So we will now move on to unit updates. Uh, we have Kristen, Kristen Zabrowski Stavisky and Raymond Riley who will be presenting the executive director's report. Well, which one of you wants to go? Ray. Ray, I'll take this one. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the co-executive directors worked with staff throughout the agency, as well as coordinated with county boards of elections and other state agencies on several issues since the June 27th board meeting. I want to start by talking about some New York State tabletop exercises. Uh, last week, the state board, partnering with Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, organized tabletop security exercises with the county boards of elections and county governments throughout the state. These exercises provided our county boards with an important opportunity to interact with their state and federal partners and the ability to continue to collaborate with their county governments. We also provided them with the opportunity to learn and interact with each other. Not an easy task given both the size of the state, as well as the difficult schedules we all face, especially in a year as busy as this. We held these events in Westchester, Saratoga, Onondaga, and Erie. We had about we had hundreds of attendees and close to full participation from our local county boards. This event was a resounding success. I want to thank the federal, state, and local partners for their participation and coordination. Additionally, I want to thank the staff here at the state board for their work. These events take months of planning, and as always, our team rose to the challenge. Uh, in the coming weeks, the state board will be partnering with the executive chamber to conduct a similar exercise with our state partners. Our top priority for 2024 is a safe and secure election event. Regarding OBR and AVR, since uh, May 31st of last year, deployment of OBR for both the state portal and the New York City portal, 93,339 New Yorkers used the online portal to register. 41,685 through the city and 51,654 through the state. This represents roughly a 37% increase in the last 30 days. So online voter registration is picking up as we approach the 2024 general. 
We continue to monitor usage and seek to raise awareness so that more residents access the system. Uh, as I said, the numbers utilizing open air continue to rise. We continue to work on enhancements to the system, particularly within the context of the agency wide software currently under deployment. Our goal is to streamline systems to provide the most efficient, effective systems for all of our constituent groups, voters, county boards, the general public interested in public reporting, and our governmental partners. In terms of automatic voter registration, our partnership with New York State ITS to implement ABR in the clearinghouse necessary to transfer information efficiently between the state, the counties, and the agencies continues. We meet weekly. Our technical teams also have regular meeting cadence. The work is underway, and we're in the final stages of finalizing the business requirements. We continue our contact with ABR agencies. Phase one remains on track for Q1 of 2025, with phase two scheduled to deploy Q2 of 2025. Uh, PCFB SBOE integrated software. MTX has been on site since March and working closely with Laura Baker and our IT unit to finalize the tech stack. Work through business requirements and develop the software. Uh, MTX has already scheduled demos for executive review this week, so that work is moving quickly and uh, we look forward to continuing our partnership with them. In terms of space planning, I am proud to report that space, the space planning, space planning project is officially complete. As evidenced by the fact that we are back in board. <laughs> uh, staff's moved into their spaces, and we once again want to thank DOB and OGS for all their hard work it took to ensure that the state board has the space and resources necessary to complete our mission. Uh, with three elections during the presidential year, we have been processing petitions and ballot access determinations continually. Uh, ballot access determinations for today's meeting involve a Herculean effort by the staff having to work a petition of over 145,000 signatures twice due to two separate specific objections filed. As always, the staff rose to the challenge and completed the task in a diligent manner. For ongoing meetings, we continue a bi-weekly meeting scheduled with the Division of Budget and the Office of General Services. We continue to meet bi-weekly with the Executive Branch. The co-executive directors and staff continue our monthly conference calls with the ECA of the State of New York. Uh, the Division of Election Law Enforcement has not met with SBOE executives since March 6. Our biweekly meetings remain on the schedule and the co-executive directors look forward to their resumption. And we continue to work on training and guidance to provide to county boards with the resources and tools to carry out the statutory duties. Uh, we look forward to the August 2024 DCA conference and the staff has worked with the program committee to craft a robust training program for that conference. Okay, so the Kristen, if she has any additional comments. I, I would just reiterate what Ray said about the tabletop exercises, uh, an amazing experience across the state. And I will say that in 2018, when we first did this, I was on the other side as a commissioner in a county, and I remember being a bit overwhelmed, but it's really wonderful to see years later, we are building a foundation of knowledge for elections and security and the commissioners are much more comfortable with all of these terms and all of our partners were wonderful, but in particular, uh, the dishes, the Department of Homeland Security for the state and the state police it was really wonderful to see the way they were interacting and their openness. And all of them said a call to any of us is a call to all of us. So there's a real good partnership. The only other thing I would add is that the executive chamber and OGS have also offered um, through OGS media some resources for us to amplify our most important message this election that the state board and the county boards are the trusted source for election information. So that's helpful. And as I said, we'll be doing that tabletop for them just to make sure the entire state stands at the ready to make sure that the, that the election is smooth and safe. And we feel very good about that going into this presidential general. You've, you're fairly comfortable with the counties are really on board now and they I am. I am. And I, you know, I think when you first come into this, if you look at, first of all, we have a lot of new commissioners, but you look at the last 15 years and to say a sea change in elections doesn't even really cover it, right? Because you have some people who went from a lever machine to mm -hmm. scanning um, tabulators, but also having to really look into all of these cybersecurity issues and understand how everything's work, everything works. And I think they're all really 
rising to the occasion. And for the most part, the relationships between the county boards of election and the IT director in each county pretty solid, you think? Yeah, yeah because of us, I believe. Yeah. Because of the, 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 what we have done to really create that relationship. Um, but, you know, before Ray and I were here, that started. And I think there's a lot. Um, in 2018, I remember Tom saying to me, oh, you came with your IT. A lot of people didn't even know their IT department in the county before that point. And now to see them coming together, we expanded it to emergency services, which I think was excellent. They, the participation from all of those uh people at these tabletops was great. The emergency services saying, you know, hey, let us know when things are happening because we can help you too. And that was really nice to see. Yeah, in terms of the IT, I will say that the most, uh, you know, the, the two groups that we saw the most of the last week were obviously the county boards of elections and the county IT department. So mm -hmm. they're, you know, taking that partnership seriously on both sides and collaborating pretty well. And again, you know, our IT department does a lot of interaction with county IT. Uh, as well as the county boards. So it's been all very smooth. And our staff was fantastic. I mean, we really literally work. went across the state for four days. Yeah. It was a lot. It was tiring. We walked into every room and everything was done, set, smooth. So I can't say enough about our staff. Great. Anything else for the executive directors? No, then we'll move on to the uh, election operations. We have Amy Hill and Judith Seymour. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so it, during this past month, we have received declinations and substitutions post primary election. Um, we, of course, continue to work with other units um, in the county boards, coordinating our communication with counties to provide relevant guidance and collect data for surveys. Our staff is continuing acceptance testing and will continue. We're scheduled through the first week of September. And since January, we have an updated number for you. We visited 25 counties and over 4,100 new and upgraded machines for acceptance testing. After the primary, we did compile the voter history for absentee early mail and affidavit for the statewide data match and provided that. So Amy, that can I stop you there for just a second? You said you're, you're uh, looking at new voting systems that the counties have purchased. Yes. Who are they, what, which machines are you seeing the most of? Um, it, I don't know that there is any, any kind of shift. Um, I can certainly get you that data. That's okay. I'm just curious what we're seeing out there for the new systems out in the counties. Are they, are, are many of them changing what they have or a lot of them sticking with what they have? About half of the counties have upgraded their existing equipment and half, uh, about half of the machines we've tested, um, have been upgrading their existing equipment and half are new purchases. Okay. So about 2000, a little over 2000 of each. Um, about 125 this last month. Well, we can get you some stats on that next month. Um, we collected the primary results, which you voted on earlier today. Um, we also <laughs> compiled a list of judicial delegates for roll calls for the upcoming judicial nominating conventions that will be held between August 8th and August 14th. And we're preparing to receive those, um, the certificates from those conventions. We also, of course, participated in the tabletop exercises throughout the state, and it was it was it really was just such a great experience, and I think so valuable for us and the counties. Uh, we have already begun preparing materials for the general election, um, including certification, um, getting prepared to um, certify our ballot, and preparing all of the necessary surveys that counties will send to us that we'll collect all of the data for. Um, we also had our kickoff meeting uh, for our federal survey that will be due um, early next year. So we'll begin working on that as well. We are preparing for the ECA conference next week. We'll be presenting on a number of topics um, with large focus on preparedness. So being prepared for the general election and preparing for the volume um, and all of the tasks necessary to carry out that election. For voting system vendors, we did receive a submission from HART, which is currently being tested by SLI, and we expect to be able to report to you next month on that, on that process. Voting registration systems, we've been continuing our meetings with NextVote and counties that are currently using that NextVote system that are um, going to another voting system vendor. As we mentioned um, in an earlier meeting this year, NextVote is discontinuing service of their voter registration system. So we have eight counties total transitioning Two on uh, three are underway right now. One today, one tomorrow um, and one within the next couple of weeks. Um, 
three in August and then two more in December. So we're continuing to support to support them and working, of course, with ITU um, and the counties to ensure smooth transitions there. And the ITU team has been wonderful in in those in those conversations, meetings, assisting the counties. Um, and then for our electronic poll books, as we mentioned at the last meeting, No Inc. submitted their version 3.6 for testing. That testing is now complete and included in today's packet for your consideration. Um, the update includes the addition of functionality that um, it's optional, so the county can opt in or, or not. Um, but what that does is it, there's a prompt that will come up for the poll workers and it will allow them to predict wait times. So I know that New York City uses this functionality um, outside of their um, electronic poll book system now, but this will allow them to do it right in their electronic poll book system. A prompt will come up for the poll worker. The interaction takes approximately five seconds and they'll be able to um, tell about how long each wait time is at that poll site. So New York City provides a map um, that allows voters to look to see how wait times are at all of their poll sites. I mean, is it real time? Yes. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Commissioner. So before I go to the poll site, I'll know I have to wait of half an hour or whatever. I, I, or I could. Or you might be able to go to another poll site where it's only right during early voting. So, voting so I can students. select which one I want to go to based on wait time. Yeah. So, so the city's going to implement this? I, so, I believe the city's already, New York City's already doing it with a different vendor. Go ahead. No, so the, the city does it for early voting currently, uh, and they do it through an internal survey system. Uh, just to clarify, the city of New York's early voting system is poll site specific. So it's not that they can choose to go to another poll site, but they can always choose another time or another day if a specific early voting site is busy. Uh, my understanding is that I, I think they're looking at implementation for the general, but I don't want to get ahead of them. So I'm sure once they have everything, if and when they have everything worked out, I'm sure they'll announce. And this would obviously also allow other counties outside of New York City to have this sort of functionality if they use this poll system. New York City seems to be our biggest problem though with wait times, right? Yeah. So yeah. they'd be most helpful in the city, probably. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would also be helpful for you for most other counties where you can go to another site. So you could say, all right, well, I'm going to the office. I'll go to this site since it's only 10 minutes. Right. I mean, one of the other things that would also be helpful is this is now uh, recording data about uh, wait time so that, you know, county boards can look at this data for the next, you know, go round and say, you know, there was a, this is where our biggest peaks are. And so we should prepare for that better. Has there been any progress in New York City on the poll site specific issue for the uh, for early voting? Um, I haven't had any conversations with them recently about that. I know from my experience down there, the biggest issue with implementing uh, countywide voting in the city of New York is the uh, ballot marking devices ability to handle the languages because it ends up ballooning to, I think they would need something like 10 or 15 ballot marking devices per early voting site, because the data of the English, the Spanish in Brooklyn and uh, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, the Chinese in Queens and you're adding Korean and Bengali, they just, the, the current certified machinery does not allow for that to be on one device for the entire county. And it largely is the audio recording? Yeah. Or? Um, because there's so many different languages, just the, the, the ballot marking devices that are currently used in, in New York City are quite old. Yeah. Is that a software issue ultimately or? Um, I think it's actually more because the, the memory that the audio is stored on is, is literally soldered onto the board. So I don't think it's something that you get to swap out. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it is, it is the, the, uh, most updated version of a ballot device that you can use with the current uh, mm -hmm. voting system in the city of New York. They have not been provided an opportunity for an upgrade from anything to certify. So. Sorry, Amy, we sort of hijacked. <laughs> You're not done, I take it. Oh, I'm, I, I, am. I just wanted to offer you if you had anything to sure. add. Sure. No, and I Thank just you. echo what Amy has said about the coordination, not only within our unit um, for the for the digital delegates, I know that was a heavy lift for, for us, um, but also for the staff uh, with ITU and the coordination with Nexpo um, to get those counties transitioned to their, to their next vendor. Um, it has not always been easy, but uh, we've, we've made it our, our purpose to make sure that we can facilitate that as much as humanly possible. 
I will say, commissioners, that operations has been having weekly meetings with all of the, the uh, counties that are transitioning. And I think that was a great thing to do, and it's been very helpful for those counties. Okay, any other questions? Then we'll move on to our council compliance with Brian Quayle and Bill McCann. I know that uh, Kevin is on family leave. Bill will be head shaved. Who's going to? Brian? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm in the in litigation realm in terms of just some of the more the active cases related to um, ballot access. There are two cases uh, the commissioners are aware of with respect to um, the uh, candidacy of uh, Mr. Kennedy as an independent candidate for president and electors. Um, and the, um, the Dutchess County Supreme Court transferred venue in that matter to Albany County Supreme Court and a trial is expected to get underway uh, the week of August 5th. Uh, the Nassau County uh, Supreme Court um, denied a venue change that's pending appeal in the second uh, department and uh, the precise timeline for that case unfolding, we don't know, but um, he made sure that um, the court and all the parties are well aware of the uh, uh, timing restrictions that we have to ensure a timely ballot um, in, in those matters. Um, and we have a um, single uh, matter on appeal uh, related to a congressional uh, nomination um, and a, a determination of the board at the last meeting. Um, the Supreme Court uh, ruled for us and uh, notice of appeal has been filed um, in the Lewis matter, but as of now has not been perfected and the preference has not been requested. Uh, so in the ballot access arena, knock on wood, we're in a pretty good spot at this particular moment. I and mean, obviously, as the commissioners know, that can change um, in the blink of an eye. Um, with respect to um, compliance, um, the, there were uh, 2,997 uh, failures to file as of July 24th. Uh, the unit, the compliance unit, had um, uh, completed uh, 223,311 reviews um, as of uh, yesterday, um, which was 2,298 since the commissioner's last meeting. And that number is substantially uh, down uh, simply because literally the entire um, the work of the of the unit for a significant portion of time was on work on the ballot access um, stuff, and then catching up with matters afterwards. Um, Thirty eight treasurer resignations were processed by the compliance unit, and um, eighty two terminations of um, either committee records or candidate records uh, were also effectuated in that. And that's it. You done. Do you have anything, or are you just give us a thumbs up? I have one issue on the ongoing litigation on ballot access. Mm -hmm. This happens all the time. It could extend on. We don't know what the schedule is uh, as long as nobody has state certification of the ballot. My understanding is we can just continue forward uh, until a court tells us otherwise. I mean, you know, in, in the past, we've had this litigation go on until days or weeks before the election, we just have to move forward. And if we have to make a change at the last minute, well, no longer the last minute, but after we certify the ballot, we can do an amendment. We, we do not, yes, and, and we don't stand and join in any of those uh, matters either. What's the time frame? I mean, when is the uh, ballot going to be uh, printed? So the court, I mean, the courts are aware of these time frames, and what is what's the sort of drop dead date? So the, so the, the certification, I think, is on or about September 11, mm -hmm. uh, yes. and the deadline to transmit to Uokawa uh, voters is September 20th. That's an absolutely critical non-moving mm -hmm. deadline. Um, so there's several weeks left. Yes. Before we mm -hmm. If if you all and we all are ready to certify the ballot prior to September 11th. If, if everything else has been done, we could certify it earlier. Mm -hmm. My only concern is purely selfish. I'm going to be out of the country for most of September. Oh, no, that's so, yeah, no, we, uh, yeah, we'll handle that. No problem. We will work with you. Hand in glove. <laughs> oh, we could do the next meeting in Lisbon. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> well, if it takes that, we're going to do it. <laughs> oh, 
how dedicated we are. I like that a lot. We have to go to Lisbon to make it happen. We're going to do it. We'll, we'll begin the memo on extraterritoriality of our media. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and I guess I, I guess it's set with council we'll move on to and fourth at Mike Johnson. Yeah, on July 15th, the peer, periodic reports, uh, final reports were due. And on the 22nd of July, the division sent out delinquent filing emails to roughly 3,353 committees and candidates that appeared on the 2024 July periodic delinquency file report. As of Friday, we got 68 bounce back bad email addresses that have been returned. Those are still being researched to figure out why they got bounced back. Was it an incorrect input or was the number address was something transposed? So we're looking at that. Once we um, figure out what the issue was, we'll provide that information about those committees to compliance a little bit later. After all the emails were sent out, we received quite a few inquiries from candidates who received the email, but apparently their committees had been terminated. It was our understanding that there was some sort of technical issue that resulted in previously terminated candidates being erroneously reactivated. Us working, you know, our IT person working with IT and compliance. Apparently, they've um, resolved what the issue. I mean, I can't expect, I can't speak to exactly the ins and outs of what that issue was technically, but I believe that the issue had been identified and has been, or probably already is, remedied by both IT and compliance. And based on the in, the latest information I received. The delinquent filer list is corrected, and the no filer letters that we send out usually we send the emails out first, and we send out the letters to both the candidates and the committees. That's scheduled to go out on Wednesday, the 31st of July. And what we did is, as of today, I checked, and there's a total now of 2,240 something odd non filers. So just from the time we sent the email out until today, the number is, has gone down quite a bit. And what we're planning to do tomorrow is send out an email to candidates and committees letting them know, hey, there was an error. And if, and especially the ones that got the email and we found out that their committees were erroneously reactivated, those people will get emails specifically alerting them to there was a problem and you can ignore our email with regard to you need to make the file. Um, so that's where we are with regard to the thing that is most in front of us right now is the non-filers. Any questions? Yeah, never yeah. go ahead. Um, not on that, but I reviewed the um, enforcement matters that you sent and they're within your jurisdiction. I just have a couple of thoughts I wanna share, which is, um, there were a couple where there were a failure to provide an attribution on literature. And the uh, mailing had been done by a group called Every Door Direct Mail. And the determination was that since the unit was unable to determine who had actually sent the mailing, um, uh, the matter was dismissed. And I'm just wondering whether in the future, in a, in a situation like that, a subpoena might not be appropriate to whoever, whoever the actual mailing house is to try to find out who the client is to see if, if we can dig deeper on it, because I just think attribution on literature is, is very important. I want to share that with you. Um, I had one other issue on number 033, uh, where um, the Orange County Board of Elections had disqualified a candidate for a wrong address. And I just had two thoughts on that. One is that kind of matter I, I think isn't even within our jurisdiction. That's something that is a problem with Orange County. And if there's any problem with their decision, the candidate has the right to litigate. But on a broader issue, and I you know I raise this um, under NVRA, if a board gets notice of a new address, they're supposed to update their records. And I believe that. 
a candidate filing a petition or an individual signing a witness statement on a petition is notice to the board of a new address and they should be updating their records and not disqualifying candidates or signatures on that on on uh on that case and um as i said uh, this is you know an issue that will come off i think it will ultimately be resolved in the courts unless the board start looking more closely at nvra but in a case like this it's it's not a state board issue it's not something we can deal with because it's really a local county board issue and the remedy after that is is for the candidate or the witness to go to court and try to resolve the issue. But other than that, I really appreciate getting all of those um, uh, determinations. And you know, it, it's helpful to see what the unit is doing. And um, you know, I just you know, I share my thoughts in case anybody is listening. As we move forward, the law evolves, and hopefully, it will, will evolve in the right direction. The the issue that you, we talk about with regard to um, finding out who mailed something. Now, with the advent of technology, it's much more difficult trying to figure out like who mailed something in terms of who paid for postage or something like that. It's gotten, I mean, typically you could go to the post office and find out, okay, who paid for this? You know, it's a bulk mailing or something like that. But because now a lot of things are done online and sometimes done through two or three different levels, it gets harder to try to track it trust me we've got a, a bunch of different tools at our disposal to track that stuff and it's it's fairly complex actually sometimes there are things that i mean i look at and go i don't even know if a subpoena is going to help us because you need to know who, who you're going to send a subpoena to so it's i hear exactly what you're saying but we've run into issues where it's sometimes a person who the literature belongs to it's like three or four levels removed in terms of who did the mailing or who paid for it so but again that's something that as technology keeps evolving as we keep getting more and more tools to be able to do that kind of research we're hoping we can you know come to some sort of understanding where we can track this kind of stuff down a little bit better well we have the subpoena power and i think uh I think we can use it a little more aggressively than we have. I agree. Thank you, Council. Mike, I noticed from the executive director's report that you haven't met with them since March. Is there a problem scheduling or is there a reason no. you guys aren't meeting anymore? No particular reason. No, because I think it's helpful if the executive directors meet with our unit heads to make sure that they are all on the same page with things. So I think it'd be helpful if you guys got together. Keep that in mind. Um, okay, we'll go on from there to uh, NVRA PIO, Kathleen McGrath and uh, Jennifer Wilson. Good afternoon, Commissioners. To start off with our general public information function since the last board meeting on June the 27th. In terms of FOIL requests, uh, for that last few days of June, we received and completed nine requests in that time. So far in July, we've received 159 requests and completed 139 of them. So total since the previous meeting of 168 received and 148 requests completed, 20 remaining outstanding and in process. Um, we work diligently on those for both uh, SBOE and PCFD. For the state board and PCFD websites, we continue to publish updated information. Since the last meeting, we have published a uh, proposed statewide ballot proposition language for the public comment period, information about multiple PCFB payment date authorizations, upcoming uh, campaign finance filing deadline information, and guidance for the electronic filing system software. And we also updated information for today's board meeting and the documents for it. We continue to have regular meetings with our accessibility vendor to ensure we are meeting and exceeding the standards as required. In terms of county board outreach, we have worked to ensure that the federal post election surveys related to the June primary election were completed and submitted to the state board. We have worked with the county boards to upload their voter histories. Sorry, the Kelly, go. What's that survey you were talking about? So we are required to complete uh, federal surveys, two pre and one post about overseas and military voters, number of ballots requested and sent out. So the statistics, it's a it. survey of statistics. Correct, we'll submit okay. that to the DOJ. Uh, we are also working with the county boards to make sure that their poll sites are uploaded for both early voting and election day for the general election. 
You may recall at the last meeting, I noted that uh, Dawn Metzler and Dan Toomey visited 17 counties in, in the month of May. This month, they've only visited one, but they've been busy with other things. So, but year to date, they have visited uh, 22 counties across the state. And as a reminder, on each visit, yeah, my guys give up that time. Is there a schedule we have of trying to visit every county every year, every two years? Do we have some every two to three to years. The goal is to get every county. Yes. Two to three years. Yeah. Year to the goal is two. Uh, but yeah, when we there was some time off with COVID that sure. had delayed things, but we have ramped up oh, now that Dawn and Dan are well into their roles and they chug out a lot. They did a whole trek across to Western New York in May, up north also in May. Um, and it's tough to time those and schedule those because obviously county boards are busy at certain times. We don't want to get in the way, but it's important that we go over that list maintenance, uh, talk to them about their grants. And so they are constantly working with NISBO and they're going to be very um, and speaking of NBRA, as a reminder, Dan Toomey does have one agency training scheduled um, in a couple of weeks um, with the Department of Health, and he has two scheduled for September as well. So he's continuing those agency trainings. In terms of our public outreach for traditional media, we have responded to inquiries and sat for interviews regarding a wide variety of issues since our last board meeting, including the June primary election results, the independent nominating petitions that have been referenced, and the objections received there too. What makes the political organization official party, the ABR project timeline, local voter registration day requirements, and the draft statewide ballot proposition language. Uh, for PCFB specifically, I've responded to a number of inquiries regarding payment dates, matching fund payments, contribution verification, and audit processes. We have not released any press releases since we last met on 627, but one is actually scheduled for tomorrow uh, to go out to what Kristen and Ray discussed about the cybersecurity events we did last week um, and, and everything that came out from those. For social media, since we last met, we did a what's called Camp Cast Your Vote series in July. It was seven days of facts regarding logic and accuracy testing that's done on voting technology across the state with the goal of demystifying the process and combating any mis and disinformation that's out there about voting machines. On our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, in each case, we have published 10 posts or tweets since the last board meeting. In addition to the camp cast your vote, there were posts about the board's 50th birthday celebration, the July periodic deadline, and today's board meeting. We have increased followers on all three of those platforms as well. We have social media outreach plans through the end of summer, including information for college students as they head back to school, information about becoming a poll worker, and the return of Fun Fact Fridays and Ballot the Beaver will make parents assume too. For our email service, it's <laughs> everyone's favorite one, the creature. Um, our email service contact list has grown 2.4% since we met a month ago. We have not sent out any blast emails since that last board meeting four weeks ago, but later this week we'll be sending one out about National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, which is this Thursday, August the 1st. And we have ones also planned for National Voter Registration Day, which occurs in September. And we encourage anyone watching today's meeting to sign up to receive those email alerts from the state board. How, are, how, how is poll worker recruitment going is that generally, which is saying? I think counties uh, communicate that it's a struggle sometimes to get poll workers, especially in a year like 2024 when you have just election after election after election uh, and er days of early voting associated with all those elections. So I know our county boards are working really hard to, uh, to train their poll workers and to recruit new and retain ones that have come back before. So uh, we, before last meeting, uh, developed um, some material that can be handed out, shared electronically as well um, in handouts to help recruit poll workers. Do we get reports them. from the counties on how many poll workers they actually are able to find per, per election? As part of their annual report afterwards, yes. And what's our sense of it? I mean, are they are they able to fill all the slots generally or is that, is that a real? Because I know they've upped the pay. I know they've done some things to try to attract the I just didn't know how successful they it's were a struggle at least still struggle. yeah right um you know I think that my experience in accounting was we were able to cover what we needed to cover but filling every slot not going to happen not right very hard we've also seen a lot of county courts suggesting alternate staffing plans to try to figure out how they uh, operate full sites with, with fewer or uh, staff there's certainly a concern, I think, about safety folks uh, when they're considering signing up. So we want to encourage the poll workers that the training they get, uh, not only that are they paid for the training, but also the days they work and to communicate all safety and security issues. 
they'll be taken care of as they're helping their neighbors vote. A um, couple more things on my end in terms of mis and disinformation, as has been mentioned a couple times already, a PIO participated in and presented at all four of the election security workshop and tabletop exercises with the other units last week across the state. We presented about mis dis and malinformation and responding to fo uh, FOIL requests, excuse me, specifically about election technology. And we used the errant text message situation from the June primary as a case study of how we dealt with and reacted to misinformation in real time. And that Camp Cast Your Vote series I mentioned was really aimed at dispelling misconceptions about voting technology by explaining how testing occurs. Uh, that's one of the goals about if we can explain it. Uh, you know, everyone in this room has a lot of knowledge about elections and voting technology, but if your average New Yorker may not. So if we could just demystify it a bit and explain it, I think it becomes um, they're inoculated a bit against the misinformation at that point. And the last thing before I send it over to Jen, um, the ECA conference, as mentioned, is next week. PIO will present on a number of topics there, including a more complete presentation about FOIL, grants, list maintenance, social media, media, and mistis and malinformation. So a complete lineup of PIO topics for our county boards next week. And um, unless anyone has any questions for me, I will pass it over to Deputy Director Jen Wilson for our grants update. Thanks, Kathleen. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Not much to report on grants since our last board meeting. We continue to receive our contract extensions and claims for payment for our nine state and federal grants. In July, we submitted our quarterly FFR, that's our federal financial report, to the EAC for our HAVA election security grant. And then we are just still waiting for final approval on our three new grants, that's our electronic poll book grant, uh, postage for mail ballot grant and to the 2024 general election grant, excuse me, for our allowable expenditures, county funding distribution and timeline. We're just waiting for approval from Division of Budget. I'm really, really hopeful we're going to get it this week and then we'll be able to officially announce it at the conference so that commissioners know exactly what they can spend money on. And that's it for grants for this one. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, then we'll move on to ITU. Laura Baker. Hello. Hello, commissioners. Um, so uh, a lot of mine has been covered. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you for the talk. So uh, we want to thank um, the Secure Election Center for putting on the road show that they put on last week. Ben Spear and his team worked very hard. Um, we also want to thank the PIO team for all the printing and stuffing of materials that went out to all of the attendees. And obviously, we want to say thank our friends at CISA for um, coordinating the whole tabletop exercise for all four days. Um, it's very exciting. We look forward to doing it again. Um, I, as a reminder, um, CISA is putting on their own tabletop exercise the week of August 22nd, and that is a nationwide tabletop um, for anyone who's interested. Do we, do we have more of these scheduled of the tabletops, or are we done? For this year, we're, yeah. we're done for we're this done year. Yeah. Okay. But ahead, the sorry. plan is to try and do every two years, uh, but not Every single county, every two years, we're going to break it up half and half. So what's the meeting in the one in August? You said the one in August is is a national tabletop that's going to be attended by states and counties nationwide, and, and it's put on It's that's virtual. virtual. That's a virtual. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, so while while we were away, uh, our our deputy CIO coordinated the moves that all of us are experiencing. Um, so everyone is in their offices and their, their meeting rooms are functioning, which is fantastic. Um, we've also launched a, a ticketing system within the IT unit that's assisting not only us in evaluating some of the requests that come through, but we're um, assisting admin in tracking contracts and purchase orders and things of that nature. It's an attempt to um, not only track what, what people are doing, but also reduce paper. Um, and automate approvals uh, so that we don't, we're not pushing paper around. Um, so in our soft launch, we had 349 tickets throughout the unit. We closed 289 of those. Um, and my, my last part is uh, we were not unaffected by the events of July 19th, the Friday tech outage heard around the globe. The, um, the ITU unit was notified about four o'clock in the morning that there was an incident unfolding. We were able to coordinate all the team uh, and prioritize um, mitigation efforts using our still in draft format incident clock line. 
which worked out really well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had mission critical functions restored by eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, the entire uh, or agency was fully restored by 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the ITU staff profoundly for all of the work that they did during that day. It was it was unprecedented, um, but they they handled it with per professionalism and per perseverance. So thank you to them. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to old business. I don't think there is a hearing none. We'll move on to <laughs> Business. So new business, we have several items. And our first one is resolution 2413. And this is a uh, uh, early voting sites. This is a uh, amendment to that. And I'm sure there's someone here on staff that will explain this in some detail to the uh, commissioners. Happy to explain it in some uh, <laughs> the, um, the The short amendment. It is a very short amendment and, and more or less self explanatory. What it does is it takes a provision in the current regulation that sets um, a 30 day blanket um, deadline for pre election for establishing early voting sites um, and uh, conforms it to the three iterations that are in the current version of the, of the statute. And in order to obviously make the two things match and what it also does is it uses plain english um, so that someone who's in the regulation and following it in order to comply with the relevant requirements for early voting will know exactly what they need to do uh, as opposed to using cross references to other portions of the state statute um, it's a it really is a conforming amendment uh, designed to make the regulation um, readable and usable by um, so there's no substantive change? There's no substantive change with respect to the requirements of the statute. It would appear on its uh, face to be a substantive change with respect to the regulation itself, but the regulation itself obviously was already superseded by the statute. So, it's been, so this is conforming to the state? Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions? On, if not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Moved. It's seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed that is passed unanimously. Uh, that takes us on to uh, resolution 2414, and that is a electronic poll book upgrade. Um, I think you should have an explanation. That's a rather lengthy, we have lengthy documents here. This is uh, no weeks upgrade. Who wants to do that? Um, Amy? Happy to, Commissioner. Um, this, is, this is the upgrade I spoke about during a unit report that adds week time functionality within the electronic poll book system so that counties that have the knowing system would be able to enter right through the system um, about how long the line is or about how long. So is that what time it's about? That's, that's this yeah. whole upgrade. It's just about that real time. Really. Yes, Commissioner. There were, were also some minor fixes that don't impact New York that are some printers that are utilized outside of the state, but yes. Okay. Great. I would also just want to point out that um, you'll see a lot of numbers at the bottom of the first page, yep. which largely are just the uh, underlying operating system on those iPads. Um, the goal is that is now functional on the most up to date iPad OS. As these are uh, connected devices, it is important that we try to keep them as updated as possible, um, the underlying operating system of the manufacturer. And so uh, this brings no ink up to 17.5.1, which is the current release. Um, and just to kind of, as another point, the 10X is also operational on 17.5.1. So right now, the e-poll books, if this gets passed, um, across the state should be able to be updated to the, the latest version of the software. Now, how many counties are using no ink? Uh, I believe it's about half of our counties. Now, the counties that don't use no ink will not have access to that sort of functionality of keeping track of poll site activity. It actually exists within 10X. It does. Yes, it currently. Yes. So you can do it 10X too. Uh, it was it was offered. I don't I don't know if it was I, I couldn't. Did we certify that whether or not it part of New York does? So typically, we wouldn't certify that sort of functionality if it was part of a previous release. It was just kind of a bell and whistle that kind of came along with it. So um, 10X offers this too. Is that true? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay. Jim and Jefferson was a 10X customer. I was a 10X customer. Okay. It was offered to me. They showed it to us. They showed us how it worked. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. 
I see. It, it looked like it would be actually pretty helpful. Yeah, for I can see that. That's nice. Okay. Um, any other questions about this? No. If not, I will entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Moved. Seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? That is also adopted unanimously. Our last item on the new business is the certification of the ballot of the statewide ballot proposal. And that is where the ones in 2015. Um, that uh, language has been put out for public comment, I know. Uh, earlier this month, they were, they were put out for what three weeks for public comment, I believe. And I know we got a lot of comments, I believe 1500 or something. Is that correct? Comments, and they've sent them on to us so we've had a chance to review them. But uh, today, the board is uh, is tasked with actually approving the language that will go on the ballot uh, for the um, ballot proposal for this fall. And, that's what we have in front of us today. So what's in front of us is what was put out for public comment back in what day was it? July fifth. Day after the poll. And this is the uh, ballot prop that amends the uh, New York State Constitution. I move the adoption of Resolution twenty four dash fifteen. All right. And I, is there a second? I will. I will second that. Okay. So. Uh, before I call the question, are there any questions, comments? I have. Comments? Yeah, I'd like comments. to make a statement on this because I think sure. it's a, okay. a very important issue and I'll, to get it right. And council will correct me if I make any mistakes, please. The law requires the board to certify language for ballot proposals no later than three months before the general election, as required by recent adoption, adopted changes to the ballot proposal process. The board is now responsible for publishing a proposed form of question and abstract four months before the general election and taking public comments. We did that. I know that the attorney general proposed language in May, which would have included the word abortion and the descriptor, descriptor LGBT in place of the more legalistic words in the text of the amendment to the constitution. The board staff, however, did not recommend either the term abortion or LGBT, and absent such consensus, they defaulted to the language from the amendment itself in their form of question and abstract. Abstract advances the draft, which is now before us for consideration. We have received more than 1,500 public comments in addition to the Attorney General's advice. Overwhelmingly, they assert the term abortion is more completely understandable than re reproductive health care and autonomy. And more importantly, the legislative history clearly establishes, as a letter signed by 31 state senators attests, that the amendment was spurred by a desire to protect abortion rights in the Constitution of this state. Similarly, the word protects LGBT people more clearly conveys protecting persons on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. I would ask my colleagues that after having received and considered the many comments, if they would be willing to entertain using the attorney general's proposed language for the form of the question. If there is no such willingness, I understand our obligation to adopt the language timely, but I also understand our language may be reviewed in court. I'm going to vote for this proposal because it's our obligation to do so, but I understand that our word may not be the last word on this, and we will move forward. I will vote the proposal. Okay. I agree. You agree with Henry? Are there agree. any other comments about the, the proposed only thing language? I say is that uh, the legislature gave us a statute. We took the wording from the statute, placed it into the proposition. I understand there's concern about readability, but uh, the statute itself, the readability is something like 35. I understand that that's an issue. I also understand that the legislature wanted to do so. The legislature could have prescribed the exact wording of the proposition as is their right to do so, and they did not do so. So accordingly, I, I'm voting on for this because as far as I'm concerned, the proposed language for the proposition mirrors very closely the language of the statute, and the language of the statute becomes part of the United States, the New York State Constitution. As they send to us. Okay. Any 
Any other comments? Anything else? I think we've got it out there. So the proposed uh, resolution is to adopt the language that was put out for public comment by the staff. And I believe there's a motion on a second to approve. So I will call the question and uh, vote. So um, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimously carried. All right. So that completes today's public record, unless there's a need for an executive session. Anybody have a need for an executive session? Yes, not. So I think we're done with the day. And uh, we'll adjourn. I'll make a, a motion to adjourn until our next meeting. We're going to set a date for the meeting. But I think the, the, the what should we accommodate? Well, I, I, the, so the, the certification of the ballot language is done by the co executive directors. In the event there are uh, ballot access determinations needed for judicial delegate conventions, we will likely be calling a meeting in the last week or the second or last week of August, depending on when they come in. Okay, so we in, in, if none come in, there is no. Uh, reason for an August meeting, uh, and then we probably resume in October. Every well, then why don't we leave it open unless somebody we needs to get one of We don't need to meet them certified at all. No, so the certification of the ballot is done by the executive All right. Okay. Yeah, we need all right. Then we'll just stand adjourned until we agree on the next meeting, which will be sometime in the future. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. This is the revised resolution.